Okay, so welcome and thank you for waking up early on a Saturday and being fresh enough to be here to spend the whole day on Microsoft Azure. Uh, I'll be starting out with a very exciting topic uh, on recommendation engines in Microsoft Azure. And, um, and yeah, I think, uh, I think we'll have a good start to the day with this presentation, hopefully. So my name is Sebastian. I work as a technical evangelist for uh, Microsoft. I sit in a department called Develop Experience uh, together with my boss, Henrik Vestergaard. Maybe somebody knows him. Or Anna Slybecker, who's very active in the Copenhagen.net user group. I'm responsible for evangelism on Azure in Denmark. And I actually have an economics and statistics background, even though I work mostly with software development now. But now that this hot topic of machine learning and big data is sort of popping up into our world of software development, I finally get to use what I actually spent five years in studying, even though I thought it was extremely boring at university. Um, I have a Twitter account, which is at Sebastian, well, it, the, my username is Sebastian BK. And then I have a blog at SebastianBrandes.com. Um, on my blog, I've actually already posted a tutorial to the demo that I'll be showing later, so it might be worth checking out um, that site later on if you want to replicate the demo. So what are we going to speak of today? If it's, this is going to change, come on. Okay. So first of all, I'll start out by mentioning some words of, of what Microsoft thinks of big data. And once we sort of establish that idea, I think it will be much easier to understand why we've built some of the services that are related to big data in Azure the way we've actually built them. Okay. So if you, if you understand how we see things, then I think it will be easier to work with the tools that we've built in the big data space. Uh, I'll then do a little quiz just to sort of wake you up properly. I know that everybody's got coffee, but maybe that's not enough. So we'll have a fun little quiz where you will have to interact a little bit. Uh, and then we'll move on to the to the real theme, which is personali personalization and recommendation engines. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about what personalization actually is, what kind of experiences you can get out of it, and what is required from the technical perspective to actually serve this type of personalization that we were interested in. Um, I'll speak of Hadoop and the Hadoop ecosystem because that's what we're going to use. That's going to be our main tool in achieving this recommendation engine. Um, I'll speak of how Microsoft Azure has implemented Hadoop in a service called HD Insight. And then we'll actually go ahead and build a recommendation engine. This is where we'll get into the nitty gritty stuff and actually, you know, do the work. Um, I'll speak of another service as well, which is called Azure Machine Learning. It's a separate service from HD Insight, uh, but it can solve some of the same, um, you know, some of the same uh, use cases that we might have um, when we when we typically use HD Insight. And then in the end, I'll wrap it all up. Does it sound okay? Yeah, I think. Uh, I've given this talk a few times before, and it's really hard to to like to to get the feeling where people are on a technical level. So I would very much encourage that people ask questions during the talk, so I get a feeling of of where you are if if we're going too fast or too slow. So please ask questions <coughs> as we go through. So big data. I think we've all heard this term, but maybe not everybody is like 100, you know, 100% 100 sure of what it actually does mean. And from Microsoft's perspective, we see some trends in the market that facilitate solutions built with, with big data. We see this huge explosion in devices. Uh, we've got more than 5.5 billion devices in the world right now. We've got this ubiquitous connection. And first, when I first heard the word ubiquitous, uh, I was kind of puzzled about it because I didn't really know the word before I, I saw it the first time. And I looked it up in a Danish dictionary, and it's more or less translated into Elistus Nirvana. So it's this idea of the internet just being everywhere, right? 
Um, and you can actually measure that in the web traffic. So um, between 2010 and 2015, the amount of web traffic in a year in the world uh, increased from 130 exabytes, which was already like an insane amount, to 1.6 zettabytes. So things are just, you know, increasing by such a rapid pace. We see these social networks that have now more than 2 billion users in the world, and I think that number is actually even larger because Facebook just came out with some numbers, and I believe that Facebook alone, so just Facebook has 1.44 billion monthly active users now, which is like just insane. And if you've been following Mark Zuckerberg, you, you'd know that he's launched, together with his Facebook team, this initiative called internet.org, because it seems like he's already captured all the users that do have internet connections today. So what do you do? Well, you give more internet to more users so they can go on Facebook, I guess, right? <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, you can talk about market penetration there. Um, and also we have these sensor networks and um, actually those two trends, social and sensors, that's what, that's what our small quiz is going to be about. So we see a huge, a huge increase in sensor networks uh, and a huge interest in what sensors can do for us, uh, not only as consumers, but also from, uh, from the business, business perspective. Um, if you couple those four trends with, uh, with the two trends in cheap storage and faster CPUs, you really have this cocktail or this, like, you know, everything that you'd need to develop solutions that cater to those four green trends by leveraging the fact that it starts is getting cheaper and cheaper and CPUs are getting faster and faster. Uh, related to this faster and faster CPU thing, um, do any of you uh, follow .NET Rocks, the podcast? Anybody? Yeah, somebody? So the latest episode of .NET Rocks, uh, if you don't know that podcast, you should really listen to it. They've got more than 1,130 episodes, I believe. It's two guys based in the US and they're really fun guys and they're just such .NET geeks and they speak about everything related to .NET basically. Not always related, like strictly related to .NET, but in the .NET sphere uh, or technology sphere in general. So the latest episode they had was on Moore's Law. Once a month, they have this thing they call a geek out, where one of them, I think he's called Richard Campbell, he's like going, like he's going all out. Like he's he's such a geek, and he's speaking of all this stuff that he's researched and this and that he knows about a certain topic. And yeah, the latest episode was on Moore's Law and how CPUs are getting faster and faster. And he was speaking of some of the underlying technologies that actually facilitate this rapid evolution and honestly the work that Intel and the other big chip makers in the world are doing is, is just insane. Well, but thankfully for all that work, we get to do some fun stuff with big data. Um, if you look up the definition of big data in Wikipedia, you would see that it says that it's a collection of data sets that are so large and complex that it becomes awkward to work with them using traditional database management tools. And I think this word awkward is really the key point here because it might not have been, you know, impossible to do it before, but it was such, it was so quirky or it was so not natural or inconvenient for us to do so that we probably wouldn't do so. So uh, difficulties included capturing, storage, search, sharing, analysis, and visualization. And Hadoop and the components existing in the Hadoop ecosystem to a very large extent try to cater to to these challenges okay and that's why we're going to focus on hadoop in this in this talk um yeah so when we speak of big data solutions they on top of those difficulties we just mentioned from the wikipedia definition there's like complexities related to volume variety and velocity and as in many like computer science triangles or triangles that are related to computer science, you only get to pick two. So either you could you could install SQL Server on a very, you know, like a quad core or a, a even stronger server with, I don't know, 256 gigabytes of RAM, a really strong server. And you would have a very fast, uh, 
a server that could serve a variety of data. But since it's just one server, the volume or the size of the, the, size of the data that you could have in that one server is just you know, limited to the disks that that one server has. Um, on the other hand, you could have, you could have um, what could we think of? Um, you could have maybe an unstructured uh, data set living in a SAN, a storage area network. Um, maybe living in flat files, so you'd be able to serve a very large amount of data. Uh, again, a very uh, across like um, a very very uh, type of data, but uh, maybe the velocity wouldn't be that high. So Hadoop is trying to solve that, and and the components living in the Hadoop ecosystem is trying to solve that all together, so that we can get all of these three things. Um, yeah, and these things do allow us to answer some new questions in businesses that were not possible to answer before, such as what's my social sentiment of my product? What do people think of my product and social media? Um, how do I optimize my services based on patterns uh, of weather, traffic, etc.? And how do I better predict future outcomes? These are the types of questions we would want to answer with solutions based on big data. So let's get the quiz. Okay, we sort of established an idea or a common idea of big data. Let's 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 have a small quiz just to wake a little more up. So do you know this guy? So this is the uh, TV host of a um, of a game ho or, or of a game show on DR, and it's called Versus. Anybody heard of that? Somebody heard of that. Okay. So the idea in Versus is that uh, there's a challenge. And then the TV host he proposes two, you know, competitors, and you then have to guess who could either do it faster or better. So it, uh, an example could be: um, we've got this like a ton of dirt right here, sitting in a huge pile, and then we have 20 school kids that all have, you know, their own space, and then uh, they have to compete against one giant machine. And then the challenge is who can move the dirt from point A to point B faster. Okay, so a challenge and then two competitors, who can do it the better? That's that's the challenge. So my challenge here for you is who's going to generate more data? Is it going to be people or is it going to be the machine? Man versus machine. <laughs> okay, so could we have some suggestions? What do people think? <clears throat> who's going to generate more data? Machines. Machines? Yeah, yeah. I would say that's a wise, a wise guess. Let's let's try and let's try and calculate it. So um, let's assume that um, let, let's actually calculate how much data that a person could uh, could generate. And since social media and social data is so hot right now, let's let's take an example in Twitter. So let's imagine that we have one person tweeting for 100 years. Um, that person writes 140 characters per tweet. There's no metadata related to the tweet, like the date or the location or whatever. It's just a pure tweet. It's encoded in UTF-8, so one character is two bytes. He writes a tweet every 10 seconds, around the clock, not going to the bathroom, not sleeping, not eating, not anything, just tweeting. He does that for 100 years, right? <laughs> Maybe that lifestyle will not bring him to 100 years, but let's just assume that that's possible. He'll tweet around the clock 24-7. He'll use the maximum characters available. Uh, and he's provided with a bit of Coca-Cola to keep up with tweeting that he has to sit very quickly in those 10-minute or 10-second uh, time slots that he has. So um, every tweet would be 280 bytes if you take 140 characters and multiply that by two bytes. Uh, if you then multiply that by 3,600 seconds in an hour and then divide it by 10, because you only write a tweet every 10 seconds, uh, you'd get 100,800 bytes per hour. You then multiply that by 24 and then by 365 to, to get to the amount of bytes that that person would generate in a year. Uh, and then multiply that by 100 years, right? So if you... Uh, actually convert that from bytes to gigabytes, you'd get that this person over 100 years tweeting full time nonstop would just generate 82 gigabytes. That's hardly what we would call big data, is it? Yeah. Um, so 
to make it big data, let's take three, the 3 billion internet users that we have in the world per March 2015. So we take those 82 gigabytes and multiply it by 3 billion, and then we get that the entire population of internet users over the course of 100 years, not, you know, not going to the bathroom, not sleeping, not anything, just tweeting like all day long, all night long, they would generate 230 exabytes over 100 years. So that's, um, that's what like the entire internet population can do on the one hand. Let's put that up against one machine. Does anybody know this guy? Yeah. yeah. So what is this thing? Yeah. The Large Hydron Collider in CERN. That's CERN bait, right? Um, just to get a scale of how big this is, you can see that in the bottom of the picture, there's actually a small man right there. This thing is huge. Um, so the Large Hydron Collider is the world's largest and most powerful particle collider. And the single largest machine in the world built by the European Organization for Nuclear Research. Okay, this thing generates 300 gigabytes per what? Second. Per second. This is an insane amount of data, right? Um, they, it's actually so much data that CERN can't even keep it all. So they put in hardware filters and they get only about 300 megabytes of those 300 gigabytes that they actually persist to storage because it's just, it's just too much. But anyway, it generates 300 gigabytes of raw data per second. If you then multiply that by 360 or 30,600 seconds in an hour and then by 24 hours in a day and then by 365 days in a year and then in the end by 100 years, you get that this machine generates 881 exabytes of 100 years. And this is just one machine. So you would have like the entire population of internet users versus like versus one machine. And you just, yeah, the comparison is just out of this world. Uh, so the winner is, of course, these small sensors, right? The sensors that we'll have all around the world, not just the Large Hadron Collider, are going to be the things that will generate more data for us now and also over the many years to come. I think we've just seen the beginning of this. Uh, actually, related to that episode uh, in .NET Rocks, I think, I can't remember what it was. I think, uh, I forgot the number, but he, the, the guy in .NET Rocks, he mentioned how many transistors there were per person in the world, and it was like, 60 billion transistors in the world. I, I, it, was, it was more than that. I can't remember. There's so many transistors per person in this world that it's very obvious that the data that we'll be getting in the future is going to come from these things and not from, from you know, social media. So speaking of personalization, um, we're shifting the gears a little bit, but I just wanted to to put in the other stuff just to get you started on this on thinking of data. So personalization, what is it really? Well, here I took a screenshot from my personal Amazon page, and I don't know if it's visible enough, but you'll see that um, that the top result there is a Dance of Dragons by uh, uh, by the guy that wrote the uh, series of Game of Thrones. Um, and he, this was probably suggested to me because I just got home from a vacation where I had read the fourth book, and I finished that, and then when I got home and I checked this and I took this screenshot for this presentation, well, it suggested this uh, book to me, funny enough. The second thing is a Spanish book, um, uh, and that's probably because because my girlfriend used my account because she's Spanish. And then the two last books uh, on the top four list here is Computational Cognitive Neuroscience and Artificial Intelligence, because those are two topics that I've been very interested in lately. So it's very interesting to see that just just from my book purchasing behavior, Amazon knows this much about me. It knows that I'm interested in you know epic fantasy and and a dance of dragons, uh, that I probably speak Spanish, and that I'm interested in computer science as well. Like it's pretty. It's a lot to know about a person from just that from just the books that the person reads, right? Um, Here's another example from Xbox. Uh, here, these top games are actually based not on a global hit list or a global uh, well a global hit list of games, but actually filtered by what 
uh, you, my friends have played and you can see that it's mentioned uh, under each title that how many friends have played each of these games and that's how it suggests these games to me um, this is a uh, like a part of a screenshot from uh, the iTunes store and this is like the part on the bottom where um, Apple tried to sell you more apps based on the app that you're already looking on um, Here's Google. Uh, they recently, or not too long ago, they announced Google Flights. Um, so once again, uh, they make use of personalization. Maybe you go into their website, you search for, for flights from New York to San Francisco. You maybe do not purchase that immediately, but you'd continue your experience on the internet. And in some other place, maybe a place that is a part of Google's AdSense network, you'd be presented with a great offer on on a ticket from New York to San Francisco, you go ahead and buy that and you're on your way. Um, and then also Spotify, and this is the example that we'll be, we'll, we'll be, um, we'll be uh, following here. So Spotify knows a lot about the songs that you listen to because you use their client to listen to the songs and they save that data uh, in order to generate recommendations to you um, for other songs that you might be interested in. And that's exactly what we're going to do here. Okay, we'll be making a music recommender based on uh, a very large set of played songs. Um, so users songs and how many times each user has listened to that given song. That's going to be our data. And the result is going to be a music recommendation system. Okay, good. Um, some general statistics about uh, personalization. 27% of customers have seen personalization online. 86% of those say personalization have influenced what they purchased to some extent. And 31% want, want a more personalized experience. 59% of customers have experienced uh, personalization. Who have experienced personalization believe it has a noticeable influence on purchasing. And yeah, so even if you're like technical guys and you're not interested in so much in the business side of things, I think these numbers are still very interesting. And if you want to get to work with this technology, these might be things that could convince your manager or the business guy in your organization. Um, another statistic to support that, 58% of preferred product recommendations from previous purchases over, forms of, over other forms of personalization. And that's actually the exact type of... Um, personalized or yeah, this is the exact type of personalization we'll be pursuing in this presentation. Um, yeah, I think I'll just skip this. This is more business stuff. I think we'll just get straight into some more technical stuff, Hadoop. So um, who, how many in here have been working with Hadoop? One person, two persons? How many here have heard of Hadoop? Everybody. Okay, so the uh, ratio of how many people have worked with it over the amount of people who've heard of it <laughs> is very low. Um, and this is actually very typical. Um, I hope that I, throughout this presentation, will give you sort of the, uh, the, um, the desire or like the, the spirit to go and play with this because it's not as geeky or, you know, hairy as people may think that it is. Uh, especially when using Azure, but we'll get to that. So Hadoop um, is this elephant, or at least it has an elephant as a logo. Uh, it was made by a guy called Doug, and Doug had a son um, that had a toy elephant named Hadoop, and that's why this technology is called Hadoop. Um, but maybe you could actually tell me what it is. So the people who've heard of it, what have you heard of it? Any suggestions to what it is? No? Yeah? I'm not an expert at that, but I think I get that it's kind of a, a distribution system to enable crunching, yes. batches of data crunching on big distributed data. Yes. Okay, so you actually mentioned two things that are interesting. So it's something about distributing something. And you mentioned both distributed crunching or distributed processing and also distributed storage. So that's two things. And you actually said both those two things. So that's actually what, it, what Hadoop is at its core. Distributed processing over distributed data. That's what it can give us. And I think I have a slide here that just says that. 
So this is a <laughs> snapshot of the Hadoop ecosystem from Microsoft's point of view. And as you see there in the middle, there are two red boxes. One is distributed storage using the technology enabled HDFS, Hadoop Distributed File System. And then we've got this idea of distributed processing, which for a long time was very strongly related to um, MapReduce. And then around those two core technologies, uh, we've got a bunch of you know, other components that, li that live in the ecosystem, such as Hive, which is a uh, SQL-like query language for, uh, for, for Hadoop. Uh, we've got Pick Latin, which is sort of for scripting. Uh, and we've got these like tons of other components that hook into the Hadoop ecosystem to solve, you know, one thing or another. Um, the three things we'll be focusing on will be HDFS, MapReduce, and then one of the green boxes there in the top that says machine learning, and in the parentheses it says Mahout. Okay, those are the three things we'll be working with. But just know that there are like tons of things in this ecosystem which is also why it might be a little confusing to people to get that full overview. Um, a traditional Hadoop cluster, I'm, I don't think I'll dive too much into this, but maybe I'll just mention it briefly. So uh, when you work with Hadoop, you would typically have a client, and that might be you or your own PC, and you would then work in a traditional sense with a job tracker and a primary node. Um, I actually made that slide with Hadoop version 1 in mind, but things changed a little bit in, in version 2. It got a little more complicated, but also better in some regard. But I still think it's valuable to, to understand how things worked in the first version of Hadoop. Um, so the job tracker would uh, take care of the distributed processing, and the primary node would take care of the distributed storage. You would then have a bunch of data nodes in your uh, cluster, and each data node would obviously be able to serve some data, but also to uh, process some data because it has a CPU other than its hard on a, other than its hard disks. Um, in Microsoft Azure and the implementation that we have of Hadoop there, each of the data nodes do not actually have their own uh, you know hard disks that they work with. Instead, we replace that bottom layer with the, with the hard disk there uh, with Azure Storage, which is another service living inside of Azure. But we'll get to that. Um, I think I'll skip the uh, MapReduce architecture. Um, just know that some things happened between version 1 and version 2 that made things more scalable and were also very, uh, much more resilient to failure. Um, if you want to dive into that, uh, we can take that afterwards, but just know that a lot of stuff has happened uh, between version 1 and version 2. Um, let's take a look at the current trends in the Adobe ecosystem instead, um, and maybe starting with a timeline. So this whole thing started back when Google published its GFS paper, or uh, their Google File System paper, and then a year later they came out with their MapReduce paper. And these two papers are available online. Doug Cutting from Yahoo and then Mike Caffarella from the University of Washington, they create Hadoop, which is an open source implementation of the ideas presented in these two papers. And they do so in 2005. Then a lot of years passed by, and then it wasn't until, I think, 2010, <coughs> sorry, or 2010-11, that things really started to pick up. And in 2012, Microsoft uh, released HD Insight as a technical preview, uh, at the time both as a platform as a service and as an infrastructure as a service solution. Um, about eight years after uh, uh, the two guys there created Hadoop, it came out in a stable version one. HD Insight then became, became generally available in Azure, and then H Hadoop 2 came out in the following summer HD Insight 3.1, based on Hadoop 2.4, is released. And um, I should mention that the current version of HD Insight is 3.2, which is based on Hadoop 2.6. So the version numbers might be a little confusing, but there's actually a page in our documentation site that will you know, map things out for you. I took some um, statistics from Indeed.com, which is a job searching site. 
uh, just to um, you know show how how hot Hadoop actually is. So in a, on Indeed.com there is a statistics page where you can enter terms and then Indeed will look in all of its job postings and find those terms and then return back a um, a graph like this to show you how many um, how many job postings actually have these keywords in them. So that's what you can see there in the x-axis um, and in the y sorry in the y-axis and in the x-axis you see the time. So you see from about January 2010 things start really started to pick up in the Hadoop world um, and you see basically all of these core technologies related to Hadoop has been increasing very much over the past five years. Um, if you compare this to Hadoop, or if you compare the um, popularity of Hadoop to other two other very popular technologies over the past five years, Android and iPhone, you see that its curve is is maybe not following as much in absolute terms, but if you look at it in relative terms, you see that Hadoop is increasing so much more than Android and iPhone. So if you've been thinking of becoming an Android and iPhone developer and you want to make a lot of money, then drop that idea and work with Hadoop instead. <laughs> okay, um, Hadoop in the cloud. So Hadoop, I think one of the reasons why it maybe hasn't picked up uh, as quickly as it could have, and maybe also the reason why only two out of this whole bunch of people in here have actually worked with it, is because setting up a Hadoop cluster is not cheap and it's not really that easy. So if you're a developer and you just wanna use what Hadoop can give you, and maybe you're not so much interested in the underlying you know, systems administration, well, then it's hard to get started if you do not have a Microsoft Azure account. But then, of course, you do. So Microsoft Azure has an implementation of Hadoop. And normally, I put in this slide because not everybody knows what Azure is. But since this is an Azure Global Bootcamp, I guess that you've heard about it before, right? Um, so this is our Azure, Azure God, Azure Guru, um, Scott Guthrie. Um, I've got some slides about Azure here, which I'll just skip. I think I'll jump right into HD Insight. So we've got a Hadoop running in Azure as a service. It started out as being both a platform as a service solution and a infrastructure as a service, but the IS is now out of the picture. So it's just a platform as a solution platform as a service solution now. Um, it's a, um, I think you could say that Hadoop uh, and HD Inside is what, or I would say HD Inside is to Hadoop what Ubuntu is to Linux. So you have this open source thing, the open source core, and then you would have a distribution. Uh, the specific distribution of Hadoop that lives inside of Microsoft Azure has been developed by Hortonworks, which is one of the prime companies working with Hadoop commercially. Um, and they've developed the, the distribution that, that Microsoft runs with. They're competitors to um, a Hortonworks out there in the field. One of them is called Cloudera. Anybody heard of that? Yeah. Another one is MapR. So there are a few different companies that work commercially with Hadoop and they have their own distributions just like you see in the Linux world that there is a Linux kernel and then you've got Ubuntu, Red Hat, um, like what are, what are more like, it, you've got like these commercially available uh, distributions of an open source thing, in this case Linux, but the same story is actually true for Hadoop. Um, I put in this slide because this is I think the best way to actually explain how MapReduce actually works, and I mentioned that briefly before. Uh, have anybody heard the, the term MapReduce before? Everybody heard of it? Anybody actually wrote a MapReduce algorithm? At school. At school? Yeah, okay, at school. Yeah, so uh, has anybody seen this word count example before? Some people have. I think this is a very good way of explaining what what MapReduce actually can do and the essential idea of it. 
So uh, let's say that we had a very, very large set of text. Um, in this case, we've got a small example, but this could be infinitely big almost. Well, not infinitely, but all close to it. Uh, and let's say that we wanted to process this very large amount of data, this large amount of text in a cluster, in a Hadoop cluster specifically. We could do so and we could leverage the idea of MapReduce to achieve what we want to achieve. So we've got this input text and what we want is the final result that you can see over to the right. So we want a list of keys, and the keys are the words, uh, and each key has a value, which is the amount of times or the number of times that that word has occurred in the text. That's what we want. So we start out by the input and we start out by splitting it up so that we can run this over multiple data nodes. And we then ask each data node to run its the mapping function. And in the mapping function, in this case, we'll just take each separate word place that in a key value in a list of key value pairs and the value for each of the keys will be one okay so it doesn't matter that it, at a key might occur multiple times like in the second example where we see car car river the mapping of car car river will be car one and then one more time car one and then river one we then have an optional step of shuffling where we can um you know group together keys so that it will be easier to reduce, but that, that step is actually not necessary. We could skip that. Um, so we'll move straight on to reducing, and that's where we take all of the keys that we have in our list of key value pairs, we'll group the keys, and then sum all of the values of these keys together. And, and then in the end, we'll, we'll stitch together those results, and we then have our final result, which is what we wanted. Okay, I think all of the problems that are related to Hadoop and that leverage MapReduce, they can in some way, or they will be in some way, put into this scheme of mapping and reducing. That's the essential idea of distributed processing on Hadoop. Um, and I'll just mention already now that this idea is great and it has been like one of the reasons for Hadoop's success, but it also has a large disadvantage and, the, and it's especially related to the persisting of data. So every time you would, you, would, you would take some input data, you'd start the mapping, you'd spin up a bunch of worker threads. These worker threads would output the results and save those to disk. If you then shuffle, you'd once again take those results, shuffle them and put them to disk again. And then when you, would, would, when you would want to reduce, you would take the results again from disk, spin up a bunch of worker threads, and then output to disk again. So, you know, you, you go through this process of reading and writing to disk all the time. And as you might know, like reading and writing to disk is something that takes a long time, and we don't want that. So one thing that we're starting to see uh, getting more and more traction in the in the ecosystem now is something called Apache Spark. It's a technology that can live on top of a distributed file system like the one that Hadoop offers and then provide in-memory processing uh, and then save the preliminary, like, you know, intermediate results to memory rather than to disk. And there's been some comparisons where you would, like there's been some official comparisons where um, there would be some sort of challenge in some very large set of data, and you would then put Apache Spark to work and then traditional Hadoop MapReduce to work, and, and Apache Spark would win by a factor 1,000 or something like that in terms of speed. So I think I'll, if we have time in the end, I'll go more into that, but I just want to say so that you know what's going to happen in that space. Okay, so we've got big data placed, or we've got that settled. Uh, we've got what Microsoft thinks of big data. Uh, we know some things about Hadoop now and a thing or two about MapReduce and, uh, and also something about personalization. So that's everything we need to know to actually get to the juice of this talk, which is how to build a recommendation engine. So broadly speaking, we can build a recommender, which is a, another name for a recommendation engine, uh, either by finding questions that a user might be interested in answering based on the questions answered by other users like him, or other 
questions that are similar to the questions that he answered already. So the first technique is known as user-based recommendation, and the second technique is known as item-based recommendation. And the type of recommender we'll be building is the first of those two. Okay, so um, I'll give you an example. I think, yeah, I'll give you an example of the data after we go through this example, and I think it will make sense why it's the first technique that we will apply to build this recommendation engine. Um, so yeah, user-based recommendation engines. Uh, let's go through an example here. We'll be using a algorithm that exists in the library that Apache Mahout offers. Um, and the essential idea behind this algorithm is that we will we have a bunch of users, and in this case, these four users are colleagues of mine at work, and they have listened to a, a total of four songs. So you see that Anna Slübecker has listened to Beyonce, Single Ladies, Justin Timberlake, and Medina. And uh, my boss, Henrik, has also listened to Single Ladies, uh, and also Justin Timberlake, and also Medina, so the same songs. Uh, and then we see, you basically see that the arrows, they represent what uh, each user has listened to, okay? If you take that and you put that into a similarity matrix, and you can do that by by, by doing the following. So you take, you take a song, for example, song one, Single Ladies by Beyonce. You then go back and you say, how many songs or how many users who listen to uh, Single Ladies also listen to Suit and Tie by Justin Timberlake? That number is two, and that's why you see the number two uh, in the cell between S1 and S2 in the similarity matrix, right? If you then go to, um, if you then take a look at S song two and song three, you see that three users have listened to both of those two songs, okay? So you can do that. You can basically take all of these arrows and map them down this way. Uh, and then you would get a similarity matrix. So this is a trivial thing to do. In order to generate the uh, recommendations, you would then take your similarity matrix, you would then take the individual user vector, and the user vector is a vector where for each song that you have in your catalog, you have either a zero if the user has not listened to the song, or a one if the user has listened to a song. So in case of Tina, uh, our marketing manager in my department. She's not listened to song one, and she's not listened to song four, but she has listened to song two and three. So if we were to generate a vector of recommendations for her, we would take her user vector, or we would take her, the similarity matrix, and then multiply that uh, with the user vector. And in Excel, you can actually do it by this simple formula. And the result would be this preference vector where you get um, a score for each song, and that score will tell us how much we think she's going to like that song. So uh, the, the song that scored the highest was song three, so we think that's going to be the song she'll like the most. But she already listened to that, so we'll rule that out. Uh, the second most preferable song, or the second song we'll recommend to her, will be song two, but she's also listened to that, so we'll also rule that out. So if we were to recommend a new song for her to listen, we would think that she would like song one better than song four based on the scores in this vector. Does it make sense? Okay, this is the essential idea of what we're going to apply in Mahout in just a little bit from now. Um, yeah, so we'll be making use of something called user-based collaborative filtering, and that's exactly the idea that I've presented. And um, there's a class in the Mahout library called Recommended Job, and that's going to be the one. So, um, yeah, I think we'll just get right into it then. Sebastian, is it always like binary where I listen to it or not listen to it? Or can it be like listen to it many times? Yeah, so very, very good question. So in my data set, I've actually list, I actually do, do have that, listen to it many times. Um, so I'll let's try and go into it. Um, so this of course takes, this of course takes place in uh, Windows Azure and while this loads let's take a look at the data and this is actually 
I'm, sh I'm unsure if Notepad can handle all of this. Let's just try. Okay, good. I need to change my subscription. One second. Uh, this one. No. This one. Yeah. Okay, so while this loads in the background, let's take a look at the data. So I have these user song. Uh, I have these user song triplets, and maybe I should make it a little bigger. Um, so I'll just make it uh, 48. So here I have a list of of triplets, and a triplet is consists of a user ID. That's the first uh, number then the song ID, and then how many times that user has listened to that song. Uh, in other scenarios, it might be a rating from zero to five stars, or it might be a binary variable, zero or one. But in this case, we will take the number of times the user has listened to a song as the user's rating of a song. Because if you listen to a song many times, probably you will not hate it, right? unless you want to torture yourself. Um, so here we have like a very long list of, you know, we see that user one has listened to song one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and you see how many times he's listened to each of the songs in the third column there. That's our data set. Um, I also have another file I'll be using, which is sample users, but this is basically just our user database, you could say. It's just it's just um, the number or all the IDs of the users that I have in my system. Okay. Um, as you may know, if you've worked with Hadoop, you will uh, there. Oh, sorry, if you've worked with Azure, you will see all of the services that exist in Azure out here to the uh, left. And I've clicked into HD Insight, where I already have uh, two clusters running: one specifically for my Mahout demo, and then if we get to it, we'll take a look at some Spark stuff. Uh, you can see out here that this cluster here runs on Hadoop 3.1, and the second cluster runs on Hadoop 3.2. You can start a cluster extremely easily by saying new, and you say Hadoop. I think I'll actually custom create it so we can see all the details. You'll give it a name, so I could call this Azure Global BC CBH. That's too. Is it already in use? Who used that? Oh. Azure Hadoop CPH. What about that? Yeah, that's good. Now you can say what kind of cluster type you would want. It's all based on Hadoop, but you can install some stuff on top of that. You can choose either Windows Server or Linux. It's still in preview to use Linux, so we'll just go with Windows Server. And then you can say what kind of version you would want. Uh, 3.2 is the newest version, and the default version is 3.1. Uh, if you click here, you will get an overview of how these version numbers work together. So, as I said, we've got a version of um, we've got a version of HD Inside, which is then based on versions of the uh, the uh, HortonWorks distribution of Hadoop, Hadoop itself, and you know so on. So you can see what stuff is actually going to be installed when you choose a specific version. Let's just go with 3.1 here. Uh, we'll then have to specify how many data nodes we would want. And by default, you get two primary nodes or two name nodes in your cluster, one primary and one secondary. And then you need, at minimum, one data node. So the smallest cluster you could create would be a three-node cluster, two name nodes and one data node. Uh, but here you can then specify more data nodes if you would want that. You can also choose um, the size of your nodes here, and the billing of this, or the billing of HD Insight, is based on the sizes of the virtual machines that you're choosing. Um, yeah, um, we'll just go ahead. You'll have then to specify username and password. You can set up remote desktop and that's basically everything you'd have to do. In the end, in step five, there is uh, the option to actually uh, make the installer run a PowerShell script. And if you want to install Apache Spark on top of your Hadoop cluster, that's something you need to do. And there is a PowerShell script out there that you could just you know, upload and then um, 
Azure will automatically provision your Hadoop cluster and install Apache Spark on top of it using that PowerShell script. Okay, it takes some time to set this up, especially if you have more data nodes, and that's why I prepared uh, these two nodes already. Um, I think we would have to. Sorry, yeah. Is all the nodes running all the time? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so the uh, yeah they are. When you configure remote desktop, you can only do that for a limited amount of time. Uh, so I think my my remote desktop configuration has run out. And uh, so we'll just have to enable it again. And we'll say that it should run out tomorrow. Uh, it just take a li takes a little bit of time, so I'll just set, uh, I'll enable remote desktop on my other cluster here as well. Okay. And now what this allows me to do is to log in using remote desktop on the primary head node in my cluster. And uh, from there, I can use the Hadoop command line to, to work with my cluster. I could do this straight from, um, from the Azure portal it's, itself as well, because there's a query console. But I actually do want to show you, you know, what's, what's underneath this shiny surface out here. So as soon as we get remote desktop access, we should be able to log into it. Uh, just we'll, we'll just take a second. Are there any more questions we can take meanwhile? Yeah? Are there any difference to the support of the PC inside in the new portal? Um, yeah, so I do not think so. I've actually not worked very much with the new portal for HD inside. Maybe we could take a look at it. <coughs> Uh, so, uh, do you do know about the new portal, right? Yeah, so it's still in preview, and as you can see, we should have... Uh, is it the intention to move everything in there? Yeah, this is going to be... It's just taking it's some fine. time, yeah. Um, let me just see, can we create a new one from here? We would want a compute cluster, right? Um, or data analytics, yeah. So you can go ahead and build. Yeah, OK, so it's not there. <laughs> Maybe that's why I haven't worked so much with it in the new portal, right? Good. Um, it's still taking some time. More questions? Yeah, yeah? So I mean, you can still do this by cluster size one, right? Sorry? So you can type one in the cluster size. So you then have another function in cluster, or does it still make the machine? Yeah, so you can type do you mean when you. Yeah, one data node. Oh, it's only the data node. Yes. Okay, yeah. The yes, yes. So we could actually, while this is configuring, apparently it's taking some time. Um, you can see that for this cluster, I just chose one data node, and I chose the smallest size, the smallest VM size available, which is A3, and it gives you four cores and seven gigabytes of RAM on each node. Uh, I didn't get to choose how many head nodes I wanted, but by default, it will tell me. That, or it will give me two, one primary and one secondary. And I can then see that this uh, specific uh, cluster takes up 12 cores. Um, so four cores for each of the head node VMs, and then another four cores for the only data node VM that I have. How many compute nodes will it then use? So, so in this case, it only has one compute node. Okay. Or oh, the data node is the compute node. Oh, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. I think this is actually slow. I think it might be there. Okay, yeah, finally it got there. Question? Yes, sure. Uh, when you say about paying, is it, do you pay a call or CPU or do you pay the usage of both? So I think it's actually based on the, we could take a quick look at that. Um, I think it's based on the VMs you have. Is it the cloud service packages? Yeah. Uh, so it's here, right? So you say if you have a Hadoop cluster, we have in this case, come on, it's not tracking. Maybe I'm using a stupid browser. Yeah, it's not often you have to do it that way, no. <laughs> Something is wrong. Maybe the website is wrong. Anyway, you normally you can. What the heck? Okay, 
normally you can uh, calculate it in here, right? <laughs> okay, but it looked like it got up and running, so we'll connect to it. And this is by standard, you know, remote desktop. And I'll log in. And maybe you'd see some stuff already open. Yeah, here we go. Okay. So this is from when I was practicing this demo before. Let's just clear the screen. So here we've got, uh, this is what the head node looks like when you log into it. You've got these uh, shortcuts here on your desktop. And the, the um, console I have open here is the Hadoop command line. Um, we could take a look at what's actually in here. Uh, we've got some examples in here, but we've also got the core Hadoop installed, HBase, Hive, um, Mahout, OC, Pick, and some other stuff. That's what you get out of the box when you install HD inside. Uh, and as I said, we will be using Mahout because Mahout is a collection of machine learning algorithms that have already been implemented in Java. And we'll be using one of the classes called Recommended Jobs to um, to actually uh, build our recommendations for, for us. Um, when you want to put in data in the um, in your HD inside cluster, you have to do that. Like there are many ways to do that, but I'll do that through the command line here. One way of doing it, now that I just have these two small text files that I showed you before, I've uploaded those two uh, to. Um, Let's see where I put them. I think I put them into documents or something. No, maybe I think I put them into maybe the C drive, maybe some data. Yeah, so those two files live on my local machine here on my well, on my on the local drive of the head node. But we want to put that into the actual distributed file system. And you would do that by a command called Hadoop, then FS for the file system. And there is one called copy from local. You then specify uh, the location of your data and then where you want to put it. So I already have, let's call it input two, and then say sample, sample input txt. It will now take that file from my from the local drive of the head node and then put it into the oh geez yeah we need to create that um, hang on we need to create that folder first right so make dear input two uh, so we will then create it on the actual distributed file system and this is a way to interact with that then um, try again. Good, and then also our users file here. Um, good. The distributed file system is all actually storage, or is it? Yes, it is, and I can so actually. Every time it talks with a file, it goes to storage to get it, and it's not caching on the on the file I/O or anything. No, so um, I'll. We'll start the recommender, and it takes a little bit of time. And when, when it's running, we'll, we'll take a look at the actual files. So now the files are up here, and um, we could actually go ahead and, um, and fire off our command now. I'll just show you that in a second. We just need to remove two temporary folders that I'd had created, or that I created when I uh, prepared for this presentation. So this is the output folder that I want to delete. What is it? Okay. And there's also a temporary folder, I think. Uh, is it here? Okay, I think this is good. So I have a command here, and I'll just go go through this with you. So this tells the first keyword here says Hadoop do something and what you need to do is to run this jar file which is located here. So Mahout is already installed and this is the jar file we want to be running. Uh, the first parameter we'll pass in is the name of the class that we want to make an instance of and this class then needs some parameters. Uh, we'll, it will need some information of what 
you know what underlying algorithm it should run and we want that similarity or co-occurrence thing that i uh, went through with you before with that similarity matrix and all that this is this and then we'll have to say where the input is and we put that into input two um and also where we want the output and we'll put that in the output folder on uh, on the output folder in the distributed file storage not in this local machine so um i'll copy this whole thing and paste it in here and let's see if this will work out for us i just want to see if it starts up and works all right um so by using those shortcuts that were on the desktop that we saw before we could actually go ahead and you know live look at what's going on while these jobs are running uh, this is not just going to be one map reduced tasks run map reduced tasks but actually uh, nine map reduced jobs uh, to compute all we want and now it's you see that it connects to the resource manager and um, it's then submitting the job and it has submitted the application is running the job and in a second we should see that it starts mapping and then reducing there's also a url you can see that uh, here uh, to where we can follow this uh, from our browser uh, if we don't want to do that from the um, you know the console uh, it takes a little bit of time so i'll show you the, where this these files are actually being placed i told you that we're not using individual disks on the servers that exist in our cluster but rather we are using the storage service in azure and i have a uh, storage account called hdi stuff here and inside of that there is a container called mahout demo and if i if i i think it's on the third or the fourth page or the fifth page can't remember yeah so here we see uh, my input to folder plus these two files that uh, I uploaded using that command before okay those are the two files here if I is it in here I think if I go back once and if I if I change the uh, access on this container to public blob for example and if I move to that fifth page again okay um and then i'll copy the ul here open a new tab paste and go and you see that it asks me if i want to download this file and if i open it it's that file okay so by doing so we can access the files that exist in our distributed file storage uh, from the public internet because it's based on azure storage and that might be something you would want to do because the output file we'll be getting maybe you want to use that in another service and a simple way of doing that is just by you know opening up uh, the blob uh, either publicly or with a key and then you could just you know access these files and use them in in some other app or some website that you might have run in some other place okay uh, let's take a look at our job here it's still running we can take a look at some of the management tools while this is running um so we'll take a look at the yarn status here and yes you could <laughs> yeah so um if we take a look here so these um when i did when i prepared for this demo it was that was on monday and today we've got saturday and we see that it already ran one, two, three, four, five, six MapReduce jobs. And we could then refresh. And, and now it's on to its seventh, right? So we can see that uh, it submitted a MapReduce job. And the name of the job was this. And uh, it was of type MapReduce. It's finished and it succeeded. And it still has a few more jobs to go before it's actually done and you can see it's also you can also see its progress out here um, you can click into the job and if we had more worker nodes and then just the single node that i made in my cluster uh, you could actually see what node is actually working in this so you get some really nice admin tools here 
uh, and these are very simple, but but they still work very nicely. Uh, so I think in a very short while, let me just see how long it's gotten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I think this task and then one more to go. And then we'll be there and we can take a look at the um, the results. Um, how big was your input data? Sorry? How big was your input data? Uh, the input data I had here was just 53 kilobytes, right? And uh, so this might seem very slow. I could probably uh, compute all of my, uh, my recommendations on my local PC much faster. But the idea here is not to show, you know, like, how how big a file I could actually I could actually process. It's uh, the thing that takes time here is to set up all of the jobs and all that. So there's an overhead involved with that, and then the amount of data that it actually has to work with matters less, I would say. So, but I just wanted to make it simple, so that's why I took some small files. So that was a really leading question. Did you make three master nodes and only one data node? But you said you need two server nodes, yeah. at least, and then one data. Exactly, Why yeah. Why you choose three master nodes instead of two and two? Oh, so I have only two name nodes, so two master nodes. If there are four cores on each, maybe. So, yeah. The cluster is two name nodes, each has four cores, and then one data node, also four cores. So that's the setup. And the reason why I didn't put in more, any more cores was or many more data nodes is because uh, my boss was, uh, I've been using so much Azure credits and it's our, we have this weird system where it's our local department paying for it. And he was like, can you do your HD inside demos with less cores or less machines? And I'm like, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you can like, clarify the terminology because when you created the group, service to start with, there was this uh, cluster size where it said four data nodes. Mm. I think maybe also what you were thinking of. Yeah. So what are they compared yeah. to? So, um, mm -hmm. so let's say that we had, um, let's say that this file that I had was larger than 53 kilobytes. Maybe it was, I don't know, hundreds of gigabytes or even larger than that. Uh, that would be too much data to process for just one node. So one of the cool things that we can do with this map reduce idea is to split the job or the the burden across many different nodes uh, rather than just having one node doing all the work. So basically more data nodes would give you more power to process more data. Yeah, but the, the question is more what, you know, when you created your Hadoop service, yeah. I think you, you chose four data nodes. Yeah, you? yeah. No, I chose one. So uh, so when I showed it to you, it's set for, yeah. but then I canceled the uh, uh, the guide. Yeah, it was just to show you because it takes about 15 or 20 minutes to set up. The default is four. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, but I changed that when I created this cluster to just one uh -huh. to make it simpler. I think that's what we everyone missed. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. It was it wasn't clear. Okay, but um, so thanks for the questions. Now it's done. So we could take a look at the results. Um, and as you can see, all of the jobs related to um, to doing this uh, have all finished and succeeded. So we could then. How can you tell that they? How many should there be? I, I, I just knew that there were nine. Yeah. Um, but also, it says here that it's actually done, right? Uh, and there's a bunch of statistics that you can go into. Um, so we could take a look at that output folder. And we'll then see two things. We'll see a success flag. That's what we have here, underscore success. And then we have the first part of the results. And here we just have one part because this data set was so small. But if it was very big, we would have, or Hadoop by default would, um, you know, split that very large result set over multiple files. Um, yeah, but we just have one and we could, uh, take a look at that by you know just printing out its contents to the console. So if we say cat output part r zero 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 zero, we then print out uh, the results. And here we go. So uh, maybe I'll make it 
a little bigger if it's possible maybe 36 okay is it large enough for you to see okay so here um, I should have said that I have 92 users in my system and that's why we see this number 92 right here um, and we have for each user in our system we do have a vector and that vector is well a vector of songs that we recommend to that user and also with a score so um, do I have some good examples here let me just look through them um, so we could take user 62 um, based on the songs that user 62 has listened to and the songs that other users that have listened to the same songs as user 62 has listened to then we recommend to user 62 that he would listen to song 2355 and we do that with a score of 12.1 then after he's listened to that we recommend him to listen to uh, 2904 uh, with a score of 11.5 and you know the vector goes on and I think there are 10 recommendations in each of the vectors for each user okay um, in essence this is what Spotify does or YouTube or Amazon or any of the others they might you know tweak their algorithms in some way or the other but at the end of the day it's a vector of recommendations and also some you know um, some indication and or some score of how much or how, how how much that user would like this this song or book or whatever it might be is it clear how this thing works okay yeah but the format you haven't specified any yet the format was a three book yeah but does it do just know that or does it require that? so yeah i think depending on what tool you work with in Adobe, there are many different file formats so these are just you know flat files that i could op open with a with notepad basically there exist other types of file formats that are optimized for other things so if you work mostly with Hive or Pick Latin or some of the other components in the Hadoop ecosystem there are specific file formats to that so Hive has, it own, has its own file format um, that it then uses if you open that with a um, with a notepad editor then it wouldn't make much sense but here I'm just going for the simple example and that's oh so sorry okay so that's part of the class that so that's defined in Methood. That's that's oh. the, yeah. That's the standard output of a new. Yeah. Yes. So there is actually. See it as you downloaded this algorithm that somebody developed. Yeah. And he specified the input is this kind of file. Yes. And you run the algorithm. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so there is actually, a, if you want to dive more into Mahout, there is actually a very good book by Manning Publications that's called Mahout in Action. And uh, it explains very well all of the algorithms that it has implemented from, you know, a statistical point of view or a theoretical point of view, but also in actual code, like what are the input parameters and how does it use those input parameters to, to generate this result. So that's where it comes from. Yeah. Can you clarify uh, where in the process you injected Mahout? You know, is it? Yeah, so I didn't get that way sure. to apply that. So Mahout by default is installed on all HD Inside clusters, and we can see the actual files in here. Is this on your virtual machine you created? This is in. Um, yeah, this is in. Um, so this is installed. This these packages are installed on all the nodes, all the VMs in the cluster so they they all have access to these files and then i went into core uh, i think it was no target i think so here we have this java file and that was the one that i pointed to when i fired off this command that i showed you before so i told hadoop run this mahout jar this is where it comes from go and find that file and then you copy that text, you know, it's a text-based file, and then you copy that into the console. Yes. So I did it. If you would do this in a large scale, maybe you would not, you would not do it the way that I did it here. Cause no, just understand where in the process you picked it up. Yeah, so that's that's where I did it. Yeah. And it does everything. Uh, yes. 
that's what's nice about it. Yeah. That jar file, that is the format that um, that defines uh, both the algorithm. And so the, the it's the it's not the jar file itself. It's uh, it's the team behind Mahout that have implemented a bunch of classes, Java classes, and methods that you know implement what we want here. And everything is open source. It's on GitHub, so you can check out what they actually did there. Yeah. You see that these guys wrote a bunch of code that defined the, the MapReduce jobs and the whole algorithm, and then they compiled it into a Java class, like yeah. they compiled the C sharp into a DLL. Yeah. And then you just run it. So it's just the, the Java running the job by which is the executable of, of Java. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good, good answer. Yeah. Algorithm are uh, written in Java. Can you what what supported languages are providing so, Angular? So Hadoop is written in Java, but uh, we've made C sharp wrappers. So if you want to make your own MapReduce, you know, jobs in C sharp, you can do that, and you can submit them to HD Inside without a problem. Um, the course Java. Yeah, the course Java. Java. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there some way to operate, operationalize this? Right now it's very democratic, yeah. but if I want this to run in a web series that I can call or something, but it doesn't actually yeah. count that well. So that's, that's where things get complicated, and I think it's a, it's a good question. Uh, if you remember that slide that I showed you before with all the components in the ecosystem, like the reason why the ecosystem is so dispersed and there are so many things in it is because you know there are different needs for, you know, first of all, consuming the data, but also, maybe you would not manually go in and train your recommendation engine manually every time. Maybe you would want to support a stream of data coming into your Hadoop cluster, you know, over time, uh, continuously train your recommendation engine with the stream of data you get in. And then you would want an output placed in somewhere that you can then consume as a web service. Those things you'd have to go and find them in the ecosystem you know so there's something called apache or there's something called storm which is great for uh, streaming data in and there are also some like you there are also some ways where you can easily get data out um, for example hive is a good is a good way there so yeah you would have to do more work to know to do that yeah you ran this command line from the virtual machine. Mm. It can also be run from any other machine yeah. by telling it the target right. Yes, exactly. So that would be one way to execute something. Yeah. So don't need to remote but I still think so. I think Hive is getting a lot of popularity. So it might be that you would want to use Hive uh, to query the data out, and then maybe you would want Storm to support streaming data coming in, something like that. But you know, that, I think that's uh, that's a topic for a whole other talk. This is talk. all about data in, data out. Yeah. Or is there anything for actually starting the jobs also? So that's also a part of, of Storm. Okay. Yeah. 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 Where did the, uh, the resulting data actually go? I didn't see that. Yeah. So it it we can we can take a look at it uh, from in here again. So it also was placed in the distributed file system or in Azure storage, and we can find it here. If we don't have to, you know, click too many times, so it's actually right here. Oh, I skipped it. Sorry, it was down here. So it's right here, actually. So it's just in the HDFS, yeah. Okay, yeah. No? Uh, say I wanted to introduce uh, some complexity to the calculations. Mm -hmm. I wanted to uh, make it introduce the gender of the person who listens to this only make that a, 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 compo a component mm. in yeah. the recommendations mm -hmm. the same gender as me should mm -hmm. value more. Yeah. So that's actually a good suggestion. Uh, you could do it easily, um, like without changing anything in the code that the Mahout guys wrote. And the way of doing that would be, would be that, okay, you run two experiments rather than one experiment. You do some pre-processing of your data. You take all of the females, put them together, and then you take all the guys and put them together, and you run, you know, two experiments. That might be one thing. Another thing you could do would probably require that you would change a little bit in the algorithm, 
and then you know introduce a gender parameter but i think you know you know preparing the data the best you can is often easier and yeah yeah Okay, I think uh, we'll wrap it up because I went pretty much <laughs> over time. Uh, I think I think I hope it's not too big of a deal. Uh, Azure Machine Learning, I think we'll save it for some other day. It's basically a graphic. It has a graphical user interface where you can build experiments. So if you're not too comfortable with the uh, with the command line, well, I think Azure Machine Learning might be something for you. It's not based on Hadoop, but it's another service that also lives inside of Azure. Um, yeah. So go check it out. That's it. Yeah.